You just said that you need to censor yourself for this because I want to talk about Ben Simmons. Bro, you know how I feel about Ben Simmons. I, I've said some things off the record about Ben Simmons that I that can't I, say. On I the think record. are actually, uh, yeah, beyond the pale, like too too much that are actually true. Potentially, Look, so so Ben anyway. Simmons for people who don't know, Ben Simmons is former a number fraud. one overall pick, um, former Philadelphia 76er, now Brooklyn Net, is back playing basketball. He came back, unfortunately, just weeks ago mm -hmm. after being away, and you and many people are already shitting all over his existence. He's an embarrassment, and I don't know why he's still doing this to have, himself. Have never stopped shitting all over his existence, I should say. Just go enjoy your millions of dollars and watch Love is Blind. Like, why are you continuing to embarrass yourself? You want him to just give up. Bro, just enjoy the, the rich, like the spoils that you created. I'm not here to say that Ben Simmons should be free from criticism. I call him specifically, I call him a flying car without a stereo. Yeah, which sounds awesome until he's like, oh, you shoot the ball, bro. And then what does he look like? That's the stereo. A Camry or something, like enough. That's the stereo. So look, I actually agree with you on this level. He needs to do something different about his shot. Mm -hmm. And many people have been saying this to him and he does refuse to change. And that part has been very frustrating for me, the guy who's trying to carve out the lonely job of being Ben Simmons political strategist. I've been trying to send him these messages around like, do something different about your shot because <sighs> there have been many people who have struggled at the free throw line specifically where Ben Simmons is abysmal. Help out ben Simmons. Oh, he misses again. He's missed five consecutive free throws now. He's abysmal to the point where he's afraid even to like really drive to the hoop in the same way because he's afraid he'll get fouled. This was the whole thing with the Hawks, you know, where he passed the ball in game seven with the Sixers and it was traumatic for me. And I just can point to many examples where like, hey, Rick Barry became a over 80 percent free throw shooter. Eighty nine percent. Because. He did what? He shot granny style with two hands. Like, and Rick Barry's been saying this forever. With my two-handed, underhanded free throw, it's a lot easier, I feel, to get in a relaxed situation. I like to bounce the ball. My arms hang down, my knees are bent, I'm relaxed, cock the wrists, follow through. So do that. The thing is, as embarrassing as that looks, it's not as embarrassing as what Ben Simmons is doing because the ball's going in the net. Like 89% of the time. I do want to be fair to Ben Simmons, his free throw stats here, because career, um, yeah, he's, this is bad. What's um, the number? Go ahead. Yeah, sub 60%, 59% career. Bro, bro, I'm not even kidding you. I could do better than that. Sub 50% No one's guarding season. him at the free throw line. You and, understand and that, And in right? fact, he's taking fewer free throws um, than ever so far this year. Um, pathetic. Less than one a game because he doesn't want to even try. No, no it's pathetic. The other thing that's just crazy about this to me, if he will listen to me for a second, Ben will listen to me, is that in Korea, in the Korean Basketball League, they're doing something completely different from Rick Barry that's also working. Because watch this, Cortez. Look at this. So this is Korean basketball, mm -hmm. and these guys are deliberately shooting bank shots oh, interesting. at the free throw line. Huh. And so all of these, they yes, they look stupid as hell deliberately try to shoot it off the glass, but these guys are collectively shooting, like Rick Barry, over 80% doing this. It's working. Clearly. It's, it's ironic, right? You don't want to be humiliated. And so you do something repeatedly over and over again that results in more humiliation when the real solution, I would argue, is to embrace a technique that everybody does and has for a very long time laughed at. No, of 100%. That's well said. And so if he started doing this and looked like an imbecile in his eyes, he'd look less like an imbecile in my eyes because the ball would be going in the net. And he's trying something different, right? And so to me, sports history is full of these things. Sports is, is such a great case study in the ways in which people's desire to not look stupid mm -hmm. make them worse at their jobs, right? Like, so for instance, I've been thinking a lot about Dick Fosbury. Who? Dick Fosbury is the guy who changed the high jump. He was an Olympian, 1968 Mexico City, Summer Games. He changes the high jump because, as he explains it, he did this. 
when I was in grade school at Roosevelt, I learned the scissors style, which was an old style. Got into high school where my coach tried to convert me to the classic style. I was a complete failure, went back to the scissors and I changed it. I moved my body position in order to jump higher and make it easier. He does the whole thing facing backwards the way he came. It was so radically different that it garnered a lot of attention and everywhere I went, the crowd was going nuts. Yes. It took a generation for all of the high jumpers to adopt it, but uh, today it's universal. I saw you. I saw, saw you. Me what? Very, very uh, obviously grinning as soon as he said <laughs> I was scissoring. Um, but he changed it to the point where he now moves his center of gravity because he's going backwards head first over the bar. And he inspired literally everybody else in the sport to do the same thing. And it looked stupid at first. Mm -hmm. And so... I wanted to do an episode today. Did you just burp? No, I cleared my throat. If you wanted me to burp, I'll burp into the microphone. I don't want you to. Okay, very good. <laughs> what I wanted to do, speaking of looking stupid, <laughs> is find the foremost example as an inspiration, potentially, for Ben Simmons, for a guy who did exactly this, right? A more modern example. Because they decided to look dumb, mm. got better and changed everything. And so um, I had to go bowling. Really? That's right. You probably suck at bowling. Not anymore. We are sitting here at a bowling alley. I don't we think don't. I've bowled in maybe a dozen years. Okay. So this is not my comfort zone, uh, leaving the studio and sitting here across from you. Uh, do I call you Jason? Do I call you Belma? What should, what should I be doing here? I, I don't matter. I, I'm, I'm good with, with, with either one. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to even further simplify it. You're the, you're the two-hander. I'm the two-hander. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I bowl with two hands. When you mention two-handedness, you sort of imagine Rick Barry in my mind, like granny style, like sure. underhand, like doesn't like... quite, yeah, doesn't quite look like that. So I should just explain what Jason Belmonte's iconoclasm actually looks like here, because Belmo and I have just finished lacing up our bowling shoes here at Bolero, this place in Times Square, and what I can tell you is that the dude's like five ten. 40 years old, dark hair, light beard. We talked about our kids for a little bit. He, he's just this deeply unthreatening and unassuming looking dad. Unless, of course, you are a professional bowler. In which case, the man is a revolutionary. Because as every instructional bowling VHS tape throughout time will teach you, real bowlers roll the ball with one hand, with their thumb in the thumb hole. This is basically the first law of bowling biomechanics. Fred, you know, through the years, I've had a chance to watch the greatest players in our game. And without question, they all have a master plan to greatness. Yes, Denny, and that's what we'd like to share with our players today, is, is one, the biomechanical movements to the foul line, the movements of the body. But the movements of Belmo's body are extremely different. This isn't granny style. He's actually grasping the ball with two hands at the same time, and he refuses to stick his thumb in the thumb hole at all. And, and so then he rolls the ball with both hands from his right side, having swung it backwards and then forwards, generating this truly impressive amount of velocity. Here's the top seat. His first ball looks good. Not sure I expected anything different. And so what I wanted to find out here first is just how Belmo wound up resembling and really epitomizing by conventional bowling standards, a completely idiotic technique. The action is from the side of the body. It's not from between the legs. And yes. so you're, you've got this um, athletic kind of approach. I want people who are not watching on YouTube and the DraftKings Network to know that Jason just put athletic and scare quotes <laughs> with his fingers. Well, because I think the, the traditional sense of the word athleticism is high energy or, you know, huge uh, exertion of power where bowling is more like golf, 
right, where you, you can see an athletic swing. And so the, the game has changed. It is more athletic now than it ever was. And so my parents built a bowling center when I was born. In Australia? In Australia, a small little country town. They'd never bowled a ball in their life. Purely a business idea that came to them oh, uh, wow. through a family conversation. And so they weren't coaches, they weren't experienced players themselves. They so, didn't inherit the traditions no, of they bowling. They, and, in, and to be truthful, I don't think they cared about how I bowled. I was 18 months old when I rolled my very first bowling ball. Today we have really light bowling balls, but in the 80s they hadn't developed super light balls yet. They were quite heavy. And so as an 18 month old toddler, I would kind of like grab the ball and roll it off the ball return. It hit the floor and I would push it and try and lift it up and then just kind of you know, roll it down the lane as best as I could. And so until I was old enough where that ball was light enough for me to throw it traditionally, I had too many years of me bowling in this way to just enable me to bowl, which was with two hands, that bowling traditionally didn't feel like me. And so it was probably from the ages of like five through 10, where you hear the, come on, you're a big boy now, right? Like you can <laughs> bowl like everyone else. And I was like, but this is just how I've always done it. There is one moment in particular that I will, I will never forget. There was this huge coaching clinic uh, ran by Australia's, uh, the Australian team, the national team coaches, selectors. It was this huge event. And so we get there, I sign up, it's my turn now to perform in front of the coaches. And so I bowl my style and the coaches are looking at me, they don't say anything. And I bowl another shot and the coaches say, Okay, now that you've done mucking around here, can you can you throw one properly, please? So I'm thinking, like, maybe they want more strikes. So, like, I gotta get strikes. So, like, I throw a ball, I get a strike. I'm quite proud of myself. And they tie me out. They go, okay, listen, um, we don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> um, if you ever wanna be a great bowl, if you ever wanna represent your country, if you ever wanna to, to, you know, win championships, you're gonna have to bowl the way that we're gonna teach it. So we need you to put your thumb in the ball and we need you to bowl traditionally. And so I humored them for that moment and it killed me because here was the very first time a, a true bowling authority. Right, the actual institution of the, the game. The actual institution of the game ripped me apart. They wouldn't help me. The kids wouldn't bowl with me. Everyone, and it was just this very alone feeling. So the very last session is uh, a tournament where we play uh, three games and all the kids bowl and I won the tournament. And the prize was a free entry into next year's clinic. I decline <laughs> the prize. Long story short, I was stubborn enough to continue on my own little path and I just, I just found a way that works for me. Jason Belmonte. Seven in a row. That's how you do it. I'm just marveling at the specific like random chance that leads to this specific like laboratory of innovation in bowling technique because you said your parents didn't give a shit about bowling the institution as it's uh, sort of like folkways and, and, and best practices were concerned. And then you pop out and you're like this stubborn kid who's always been that way it sounds like. Always. And you're like kind of this weirdly accidentally perfect messenger for this, uh, this larger idea that you don't need to do it this way. You can look at it from that lens when you, when you look back at it. But when you're in, in the middle of it during yeah. the moment, you're not thinking about what this is gonna turn into or you don't think about my decisions today are going to have this kind of an impact down the road. This was just one little boy who wanted to do it his own way. And at the time, that's all I cared about. Now that I've had a career and I look back at it, the thing that I think I sometimes marvel at it is that, yeah, I mean, if I didn't start bowling at the, at the age that I wanted to start bowling, would I have developed the style 
or would I be traditional? Right. I, I don't know. Right. And so there are so many things, which is the slide indoors, right? It's, yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. the butterfly effect. It's like, I couldn't have written this script any better well, that's, than how that's it happened. Well, that's what's so actually. funny to me about this is that, yes, there's an alternate timeline where you're a one-handed bowler. I don't know, would you suck in that world? Probably suck. <laughs> <laughs> Some other kid would invent two-handed bowling and I'd probably be like, oh, that's not how you're supposed to do it. Right. You're supposed to bowl like me, yeah. traditionally. You'd be the bully. You'd be <laughs> yeah. one of the bullies. I'd be the, the, the traditionalist that's upset at this new wave coming through. Jason Couch, your take on two-handed bowling. I think it's a travesty that it's in this sport. I'm old school. If you, could, if you couldn't do it with one hand, you didn't try and do it with two. You just tried to make yourself better. <laughs> I'm going to start this conversation off with, I love my time here in America. Okay, so... <laughs> this is like, anytime so, someone begins on, to say that. Hold on. All right, I'm going to start off with, <laughs> America, I love you. And this is the home of bowling. This is, uh, you know, the American idea of bowling is rooted in pop culture. Yes. It is important yeah. to America. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. The Big Lebowski. I bowling get it. ties the whole room that is America together. That rug really tied the room together, did it not? F***ing A. This guy peed on it. Donnie, please. So when I came onto the scene, I'm Australian. I bowl differently. I knew I was going to ruffle feathers, but I didn't realize it was going to be that much. <laughs> They have said, you are now here. This is the USA. The big leagues. You are starting from the bottom again. And so I had to like accept, right, I'm going to have to do this all over again. The biggest difference is Americans are loud. <laughs> and I would come back after a tournament going like, fuck, this is, this is a hard day. Because, you know, I'm getting heckled. No one else is getting heckled. I'm getting heckled from the crowd. And I haven't experienced that type of heckling. You know, it is go back to your country, Right. it is, you're in our country, bowl the way we do. And again, I'm like, it's just a game of bowling, guys. Like, why are we, why are we doing this? And I, I had to fight through that, and that was, that was hard. I apologize for smiling through your trauma. <laughs> I do too. It, it's, a, it's a weird thing, because I look back and, and there were so many sad days, because you, you're in, in this little environment and... For me, bowling was like my second home. It was a place I loved to be and I loved the game so much. And so when you have that passion and love with something, you want to share it with the people around you. And when the people around you are like, we don't want to bowl with you. Like, or you got to change. Or you got to do something different. Yeah, it was like, I don't get it. The biggest, I think, switch in that, which when it came from feeling a sadness to a feeling of, of joy yeah. was when... I would start beating them. Because now when they would say something, my return was always, look at the scores. <laughs> like I, just, I just beat you. So whatever you're saying right now, it's even harder to convince me you're right because I'm, I'm, not, just, and I'm not just beating you by one or two pins. Like I am smashing you guys. <laughs> so now what? And so it's always nice to have that ace up your sleeve when, when your scores tell a a bigger picture. So not only was I stubborn, now I had the arrogance. And he does it. Jason Belmonte earns his first PBA major. Sports often feels like it has antibodies sure. that are rejecting foreign uh, invaders. And you were a foreign invader. And maybe the way that was just expressed, um, if I'm getting your story right, is that looks f stupid. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's not, the antibody. And it's not how the game was meant to play. Okay. So that's the traditional, that's the, any sport. Yes. That's not how I grew up with it. This is not how I was taught it. And therefore this new way of doing it doesn't compute. I would like to read you, uh, Jason, a quote because it was the Players' Championship, it was 2012. Um, there was a TV interview before the final and your opponent, a gentleman named Mike Devaney, uh -huh. he said this. Uh, not watching Belmo and all that it's, doesn't impress me. Not interested, don't care. I throw it the right way, I put my thumb in there, the way I was taught, and we all, everybody should throw it. So I'm gonna show what's up, what's up right now. Thanks Mike, good luck. I remember the day and I was so focused about winning that I heard the quote, but I didn't let it necessarily affect me in the moment. Mike Devaney needs a double and seven. Anything less, Jason Belmonte wins for the third time 
at this year's World Series of Bowling. And Belmo wins it. It was until the moment where I had won and then I could reflect on what had just happened that that quote, yeah, cut a little deeper. But when I hear it, the one thing that always kind of rings in my ear about it is like, why do they care? That's the thing that always, I always go, why do you care so much? Right. And so if my score was worse than theirs, they probably wouldn't care. So this is what a, a Hall of Famer in your sport, in the PBA here in America, once called you. He called you, quote, a cancer to an already diseased sport. Yeah, that one hurt. End quote. Brian Voss, Mr. Brian Voss. Um, Why? What, what made you cancerous to Brian Voss? I'm going to defend him a little bit. Okay. I don't think he was referencing me as a, as a human, as an individual. I think he was referencing what I do, my craft. And you can't deny that Brian had a, an extreme passion for the game and he wanted to protect it how he thought was best. He thought something that was challenging its fabric was this new technique. It was the two-handed backhand in, in tennis. It was the Frosby flop in high yeah, jump. Yeah, Dick Fosbury, um, yep. This was his version of all of those things. And he didn't like it. He, he was scared for the game that he grew up with, the game that he loved. I think what saddened me at the time was this was one of the greatest players in our history. Someone who I revered and someone who I competed against, someone who I had drinks with. He's actively trying to say that we cannot let this technique, your craft, your approach, um, destroy the game. And this is coming back around to the whole cheating aspect. And that allegation, though, on the level of the rule of law. Yeah. So the, <laughs> what does that the, the mean? word cheat hits me hardest because my understanding of the word cheat is you know uh, the boundary of the rules and you are choosing to purposely step outside of them to break them. You are cheating the game. I am within the rules. There is no rule to say that what I do, I am breaking. And therefore, because I'm within the square of the rules, to call me a cheat, now you're attacking my character as a person. You're, you're suggesting that I will purposely go beyond the rules. So what I'm doing, it breaks that mold. And to them, it hurts them. You know. And I have to accept that. But this is where I now need to officially inform you what the rest of bowling has had to accept about Belmo. Because the guy isn't just a really good two-handed bowler at this point. For the last decade, Jason Belmonte has been nothing short of this generation's most dominant professional bowler, period. He's won an all-time record 15 major titles. He has a record-tying seven Player of the Year awards, and counting. All of which means that that kid in Australia who got bullied, who no one wanted to bowl with, that kid is now, very arguably, the greatest bowler who ever lived. The best bowler on the planet steps up. Jason Belmonte, better known in the bowling world as Belmo, is a star of his chosen profession. There's no one else on this planet that can bowl a ball at 10 pins better than me. And that is a really cool thing to say. And I never knew I'd ever be able to say it. So now that I can, I plan to say it as often as I can. And look, yes, as Belmo told me at one point, he would love it if there were another zero at the end of the paychecks that you get for being the greatest of all time in bowling. You get $100,000 for winning the Players' Championship, for instance, which just means that Belmo, despite winning that thing three times, is still flying coach from Australia. Uh, you know, just a reminder that the PBA is absolutely not the NBA. But what Belmo does have somehow, which very few, even NBA players have, is a song 
that someone wrote about him. It's a song that another bowler, actually, named Kevin Williams, wrote and performed about Belmo's life. Kev's a great young kid, super talented bowler, also a really talented musician and loves to rap. So I'm like, hey, we should, we should do a song, we should write a song. Like, and, and, in, and maybe I can play it as like my strike song on the, on the PBA yeah. show. And so we did, we, we found a beat, he, he thought up some lyrics and I, the only direction I gave him is I said, write about me from like your perspective. Which means that every time you bowl a strike. They play the music in the background and it's Kev's song, yeah. But let me ask about why it is that your response, um, like in modern times now, we're catching up to the present, um, is something that a lot of the people who had been bullied or attempted to innovate and even successfully innovated, I don't see them do what you do, which is you actively like lean in and mock the mockers and make fun and make videos that are defiant and unapologetic and you gladly say i'm the i'm the two-handed bowling guy like that's not a thing that uh, a lot of other people in your position in other sports have have done to that degree i i don't mind trolling the trolls back and so there's so many things that I think about. What would be kind of funny? Uh, and one of the videos that I, I think you might be referencing is I, I purposely created this um, fake uh, neurological disease. Is I have a condition, singular chirophobia, the fear of using one hand. My earliest memories, uh, I remember going to, to the doctors a lot and seeing one doctor and another doctor and a specialist and every doctor, I just remember saying, you know, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. And I'm afraid he was born with it. Um, you know, there's no cure. Hey, I bowl with two hands, but don't hate me. I have this problem. Everything I, in my life, I do with two hands. You know, even using, you know, cutlery. I can't just butter bread, you know? It's a process, um, you know, going out to restaurants, it's embarrassing. So I'm having a laugh about it. And in my mind, I released this video, it looks obvious I'm, I'm having a laugh. Turns out not everyone thought I was, I was joking. And so I had this flood of people saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I've, I've been hating on you for so long. And now I realize it's not your fault. You were born this way and there's nothing you can do about it. How you go through your life. So I'm like, okay, now, now I need to address this. Right. Because <laughs> you're, you, you could go two ways. You can come clean or fundraise off of this. <laughs> and my fear was, is I, these people now, like they're saying they love me where they once hated me. So I'm like, if I tell them, that I'm lying. This is all fake. This is actually my favorite of all the sliding door timelines of your life is the one in which you now have to perpetually argue that this is real. I end up shooting another video in which I find this underground doctor that has special pills that will cure me. All you need is one dose, pop it in, chew it up. You gotta chew it up. Are there side effects that I should know There's about? There's too many, too many side effects to go into right now, but believe me, it's going to cure all your ills. Doctor, thank you so much. You have no idea what this is going to do for me. Godspeed. You, you are think, such a troll, you, you man. would think people <laughs> would know that they would put two and two together. So this leads to this uh, like fairly stunning phase to me as a bowling outsider, where unlike in these other sports where, again, Rick Barry didn't inspire everybody or all of these people who shoot differently and shoot weirdly, they didn't change their games. And by there, I mean their sport. Mm. They didn't change their sports. Um, 
your problem now seems to be <laughs> that everyone else, or at least a lot of these younger bowlers, now want to be specifically like you. And that your once shamed technique has become like clearly in vogue. Yeah. I I don't I don't often get um like emotional. There are moments where I'm like, I'll get a fan mail or a kid will come up to me in person and he'll tell me a little bit about his story. And sometimes there's a lot of trauma in this kid's life and he uses bowling um, as a way to escape it or to bring joy. And then he'll bowl the way that I do. Then you pan out and you see hundreds of thousands of people around the world now. Is it really that many now? Hundreds of thousands of people, My God. maybe more. I, I, the, the last, it, it is more. The last estimated count was somewhere in the 30% mark of bowlers, old and young, who are either starting off bowling the way that I do or, or adapting and adopting the new style my style and so that number is growing exponentially quicker as well Jesus. and so you hear these stories then you go to a bowling center and you see the impact with your own eyes where when i was a kid there was me no one else to now as a 40 year old guy walking into a bowling center and it's everywhere the feeling the overwhelming feeling of seeing a change of an evolution of just not just through my own personal game but the sport made that that's one of those like me moments you know, like that's like oh, with two hands <laughs> yes need seven first right one big shot for kyle troop one big event he wins the 2023 pba tour from gothenburg sweden jesper svensson Yep. Needs three. Gets all ten. Give him number nine. Let's meet Anthony Simons. Simo is the baby-faced bad boy of bowling. Dropping out of high school at only 16 to become a pro bowler, his scrappy style has gotten him far. When you grow up on the lanes, you grow up fast and tough. He's known for his low-to-the-ground, aggressive two-hand style and aggressive attitude on the lanes. Some of these kids are really good. Super good. And they're coming for you. Like they're actively um, like coming for the titles, the trophies. I mean, you, is it 15 major titles that you've won? Um, that's more than anyone else in history. Uh, seven player of the year awards. Mm -hmm. um, that's tied for the most all time. There are these young two-handers who want everything that you got and they're using your tools to take it from you. And I just wonder what it feels like to be somebody who's now seen the full circle. And then truly, it's, it's such a phenomenal sports story. You've seen the full circle of start by being shamed and laughed at and then try to be destroyed before being too effective. And now suffering potentially because people are going to use it against you. Yeah. What does that feel like? What's that emotional um, reaction when you get beaten by a two-hander. When I lose one-handed, two-handed, I'm, I'm equally disappointed. I'm, I'm pissed. And so I try not to separate who beats me by, well, he was two-handed, so it's a little bit okay because, you know, we bowl the same. No, I'm still pissed. The thing that I'm realizing now and why these kids are so good is because of what I've been able to do and they've been able to, put me up as a, as a pin on the pin board to, to study. And I never had that. My son today can YouTube everything. One of the biggest growing trends in bowling is two-handed bowling. Almost all the young competitors out there to generate that power are bowling two-handed. And today we're gonna attempt as best as we can with coach to talk a little bit about the two-handed style. Yeah, as you mentioned, you were right, Mike. It's I was walking in blind. How do I fix my swing? I don't know. I guess I'm just going to have to go to the bowl and for a week 
every day I'm gonna have to try new things. Now someone takes my game, pulls it apart and says, are you having problems with this? This is what Belmo does. How about you use this kind of technique in your swing? And it fixes them. And then I have to combat watching the kids on tour go, hey, that looks a little, that looks a little bit like me. Like that's, that rhythm <laughs> looks a little bit like me or that, yeah. that role or what you're able to do with the boy. I think I, I've been doing that for a while. And it's the ultimate compliment. But it's also like, could you not have come like five years later? Like, let me, <laughs> let me have retired. I'm still here. <laughs> let I'm me have still retired. doing this. And then you can all go and break all of my records. It's kind of an amazing uh, concept. The idea that the revolution comes back around for the revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I liken it to watching Tiger Woods swing a golf club. Like when Tiger first came out, no one was ex as explosive. He was always the longest driver. He was always hitting the clubs the furthest. He happened to also be a great putter and chipper. And he also happened to have touch and skill and creativity. And so when I watch somebody like that, watch the kids come through, hit it further and whatever. How did Tiger continue to win? Well, Tiger became even more creative. And I think that's something that I've learned from Tiger is look, I can't rely on certain aspects of my game as I could 10 years ago when I was the only good one doing it. Now you have to, you have to be creative. How are you gonna separate yourself from the kids that are learning from you? But the one thing they'll never be able to, to copy is, is how I think. And I think that's where I really want to separate myself is that mental game side is just be like, you can throw it like me all you want, but what's going on between the years and how I'm strategizing, I'm not going to tell anyone that. So the title that you get often uh, given is, is GOAT, is greatest of all time. How does the superlative uh, that you get presented with feel what do you find more valuable? What's, how do you make sense of, of those uh, honors? The comparisons to like the Tiger Woods of bowling or the Steph Curry of basketball, super flattering. Um, and I think the one parallel to all of that is bowling seems to be just next in line of the evolution of its game, right? Like Tiger changed golf. Steph is changing the way we value the three point shot. I'm changing the way you bowl. Um, there is a part of me about that legacy, right? Is when you get to a certain stature, you start thinking, right, well, how, how do you, if I could, how would you like to be remembered? Yes. That's right your obit. Yeah. Jason. So a huge part of me wants to be remembered as the, the greatest that has ever laced up the shoes and rolling a ball down the lane. There's a huge motivation for that. However, I'm really cautious to be the, labeled the best two-hander of all time. And so my victories in my mind is I'm, I'm chalking up more runs on the board that will separate me from just a two-handed mm. player to no, we're encompassing everyone that's ever rolled a ball down the lane because his stats are proven otherwise. So when I watch Steph play, I watch LeBron score the most points, I ask myself, like, I wonder what their legacy that they want to be remembered for. And I promise you, Steph will, be, will go down, maybe not as the GOAT of an all-round player, but he will be the GOAT of shooting the ball no from the perimeter. And for me, that legacy isn't to be singular. He's the greatest at one thing. It is, I want to be the greatest at it all. Yeah. And that's not easy. And that's a, that's a wild, that's a wild thought. And it's also an arrogant thought to presume. I was going to say, you're like, you're, you, you're not pushing Steph Curry away with two hands. Right. You're like, nah, not for me. I've got to let my score do the talking again. And that's a huge motivator. When I step up on the approach and I throw that strike, I'm throwing it for today, but I'm also throwing it for what is going to be said about me into the future. And I love that pressure and I love that passion and I love being in that position to influence my future based on what I'm doing today. So embrace it, enjoy it, but also know that no one will set an expectation higher than I set for myself. So whatever you're thinking of my capabilities, I'm thinking beyond it and I'm believing I'm gonna get there now. That feels like a real warning to these kids. Maybe it is. <laughs> 
I would like you to help me though. I would like to peer inside of your brain because I am, uh, as I said, I am, I'm kind of like an infant when it comes to bowling. Um, Listen, I have no problem helping out an infant. <laughs> okay. I have no problem plan, helping out a total non-threat. If your plan, if your plan was to secretly take over the game of bowling, and you wanted to, I mean, to I'm 39, everything. buddy. It's still got some years left. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I'd have second, second, second thoughts. But you no, know, we, we can definitely fix you up here. Yeah, because I we're about to uh, have the Pablo Torre finds out uh, like staff uh, bowling tournament. Mm -hmm. later today. Okay. What I need to do is show everybody else. You need uh, a trophy. That's what you need. I, I cannot let my staff beat me. Yeah. How you're thinking about your staff is how I think about with my family. Like my son, he's 12 years old. He's a bowler and he always wants to bowl against me. And I will never let him win. <laughs> He will always throw it in my face and your staff are going to do right. the same thing to you. That's right. You're going to yell at them for not being late and you know what they're going to say? Well, I got the bowling trophy. God, what do you say about that? It's going to be the worst, <laughs> the worst thing in the world for you. Help me. So we're going to fix Help that up. Help me, Belbo. All right, let's, 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 let's get some private tutoring. I can do it. Okay. Can you show me how it's done? So Jason Belmonte has taken his ball, his Excalibur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's three in a row. Do you so know what that's called? This is what's three, three strikes? What's three in a row called? I'll give you a clue. It's a bird. The flamingo. I can. I've never seen a flamingo in real, real bowling life. Turkey. Just showing off. I'm noticing that his shoes have his own image on them. They say Belmo. I don't know what we're going to expect here today. Yeah. Typically, I'm probably drunk. Um, the last time I played. The uh, good news is, game. when you're drunk, there's yeah. more pins to look at usually. Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. Twenty of them. Confidence so it helps. <laughs> helps the score. Usually, the way that I like to work is I ask the player. Just throw me your shot. Yeah. So I know. This is the most what, humiliating what part, potentially, <laughs> is I reveal what me. it is that I'm here uh, to do. Um, so we're standing in front of I don't even, it, the, the bowling rack. Sure. Ball return. Very confident in all of these terms. So, so I'm going to select the ball. If you're small, medium, large, extra large. So what we're going to do yeah. is I believe you could probably take the green ball. Okay, that's you a large. You could even take mine if you wanted to. Whoa. I think you could. Okay, all right. I think you this could is, handle this it. is not all a thing right. that I expected to be given the privilege. Touch my ball, mate. You can touch my Yo, ball. Yo, okay. So this all is right. very, very heavy. It says absolute power. That's the name of the ball. With various lightning uh, iconography on it. Yeah. So um, that this is my sponsor's oh my equipment. And I'm noticing that there are two holes. Two holes, no thumb hole. No thumb. Right. And we're going to use our two middle fingers. Yeah, like this. Perfect. So, okay. Stick them in. Ring and middle in Perfect. there. Okay. Now, this hand yep. is going to essentially cradle the ball. So, hold it by your waist yeah. with your hand underneath it. Yep, cradling balls. That's yep. it. I yep. kind of want you to on, on stand on the side a little bit yep. and then just kind of rock it. Just yep. kind of rock it. And so that natural rock that you're doing right now is going to generate rotation. Yeah. When you let it go, you're actually going to hook the ball yep. if you do it like okay. that. Okay. Go and throw a shot. Let me just see what we're working with Jesus and then we'll Christ. figure stuff okay, out. Okay, here we go. All right. There you go. It's not bad. It, it's, okay, it's now, bad. Now, all right. To so be it's very bad. clear, it went into the gutter. Yeah, okay, it's bad. So it was not bad. bad for like. Until it was bad. I'm getting flashbacks to various things in my life that have involved a lot of this vocabulary, but yeah. <laughs> when was the last time that specific ball has ever touched a gutter? It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. It's been a little while. How deep should my oh, fingers wow. be in these holes? Well, your fingers and my fingers are different size. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah. the holes, this is designed for me. Yeah. I can't remember the last time someone stuck their fingers in my ball, so. This is a privilege? Yeah, and it's very uncomfortable for me. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna be gentle. Okay, thank you. Okay, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so stick them in. Yeah, gently. They're in there for okay. the for the podcast audience. Now they're in there. All right, try it again. Yeah, Don't okay. have to throw it too hard. Yep. Just kind of roll it through there. Be gentle yep. with okay. it. Little outside, a little, but we have we have an improvement. <laughs> There's always a moment mm -hmm. where it just like. I get it. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, that's yeah. how it's supposed to feel. Okay. And when you hit that moment, there's usually a, a euphoric feeling of, let me do it again. Yeah. Let me do it again. So I don't know when that moment's going to happen for you. I just want to hear- We may not have enough tape in the cameras. For that reason, I told them to bring more tape. More tape. And when that day happens, oh, you better text me. You better say- <laughs> When that year comes to pass. Call me in Australia, in Orange, Australia. I'll be on my deathbed 60 years from now and my phone will vibrate and it'll be like, Pablo, what? Oh, he did it. Oh, And it's just going to be me rapping your strike song. <laughs> All right, try it again. All try right, it here again. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Oh my God, that's going to be really close to like seven. All right, we got seven. All right, look at that. Three, now seven. Our increments are going above I just, expectations. I just want to be clear for the audio audience that what I'm feeling right now is a power unlike any I've ever felt. <laughs> what have I created? <laughs> I've been emboldened. That's really, really close. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yo! That's a spare! Dude, that's the second best thing you can get When I tell you that I'm going to f destroy the Pablo Torre finds out staff tonight. <laughs> I f***ing mean it. Uh, I have I have no doubt. Anything is possible! <laughs> so I should just uh, check back in here with a quick postscript about what it is that I found out today at the uh, Pablo Torre finds out bowling tournament. Um, I, I didn't win. My staff's good somehow at bowling. Cortez is somehow good at bowling. How is he good at any of this? Um, Nooch is like a pro, basically. I, I, I went two-handed the whole time, as per my tutelage from the greatest bowler of all time, and I was not part of the revolution. You don't need to check the scores. Like, uh, just know, you know, don't, don't need to dwell on it. Um, I, I didn't win. Didn't go, didn't go well. Like, what the f***? What I found out, today is actually that I find myself relating at the end here to uh, Belmo's fellow Australian in a cruel bit of irony uh, Ben Simmons didn't come through in the clutch I should I should just be uh, man enough to admit that hey, look this is hard it's supposed to be hard right like maybe maybe uh, the real bowling title is the friends the, the friends we made along the way now the journalism we did but no more questions. This has been Pablo Torre Finds Out, a Meadowlark Media production. And I'll talk to you next time.